Sciences and Professional Studies, Mr. Kenrick McSween, um, and our Associate Dean of that same school, Mr. David Ambrose. We have with us um, members of the College Council, some of you in online, and we have the Chief Education Officer, Ms. Angela Finley. We welcome all of you. Um, to the panelists, I would introduce the panelists. We have five esteemed um, members of our Grenadian community here with us. Uh, Mr. John Angus Martin, he is a historian, archivist, and museum curator with a multidisciplinary academic background and diverse professional experiences. He's currently the executive director of the Grenada National Museum. He specializes in Grenada's history and culture, in its research and interpretive spaces, and explores identity and historical relationships across the archipelago. He is the author of several books on Grenada, including The A to Z of Grenada Heritage, New and Revised, 2022. Next to him is Mr. Terry Noel, who is currently a lecturer in history here at TAMCC, and he was a former opposition senator in the Parliament of Grenada. Then we have a student, in fact, we have two students with us, and we're quite happy that we have two students on this panel, Akima Tellisford Modest, and I must say, a former student of the Anglican High School. She's currently pursuing an associate degree in social sciences, specializes in law, specializing sorry, in law, history, and sociology. Then we have one of our lecturers here at TAMCC, Ms. Vanessa Barrett. She's a graduate of St. George's University, and for the past eight years, she has been employed here at TAMCC as a lecturer in sociology and Caribbean studies in the Department of Social Sciences, the School of Arts, Sciences, and Professional Studies. And finally, we have Ms. Jada Glean. She, too, was a former student of the Anglican High School, and she's currently pursuing an associate degree in social sciences. Her majors are law and literatures in English. And I am Wendy Grenade. I'm the chair of the Times UC Council, and I'm delighted to be here um, hosting this panel discussion. And I want to welcome all of you and to thank GIS for covering this event for us. Uh, Mr. David Ambrose has been very instrumental in organizing this, and I want to say thank you very much. Now, the title for this year's independent celebrations, aptly so, the journey to 50, reflecting on the past, planning the future. What a very important title for us to be having this conversation around this afternoon. Now, Tam CC is Grenada's, Grenada's premier tertiary institution. And it's important as a college that we engage in these kinds of conversations, these kinds of intergenerational dialogues, where we have seasoned historians and young students trying to help us make sense as we look back and gaze at 49 years, and as importantly, we look forward. So in terms of how we would go about this afternoon's panel discussion, I would first ask the panelists to speak for about a minute or two just on the broad topic. What does this topic mean to you? The journey to 50, reflecting on the past, planning the future. After they've all done that, then each of them would focus on specific areas. So we'll hear from them in a general sense, and then we'll hear more specifically from them in terms of the areas that they are focusing on specifically. So I would want to begin right here with John Angus Martin. What does this title mean to you, the moment, the journey to 50, reflecting on the past, planning the future? I guess I would probably be dating myself if I say I was a little boy when, <laughs> uh, very little boy, uh, when we started um, this journey, uh, independence. I remember different aspects of it, um, even probably going up to the fort. We used to go after the police ban. Um, kids don't do that anymore. But um, I think for me, having witnessed when it all began, in, in a sense, um, it somehow is fitting to be at this moment, trying to figure out what, what we have achieved, have we achieved much, uh, considering we've gone through 
a revolution in that process, a US invasion and, and, and other uh, really big events that has totally changed from where we probably thought we could have been um, as, as, and, and, and where we probably could be. So for me, I think it's, it's in general, it's, it's been positive, a positive experience. Um, the journey has had its ups and downs, uh, but I look forward to the next 50 years because I do feel that we have begun to set the foundation for the last, for the last 50 years. I think we could have achieved much more, but I do think that we built enough um, that we can see ourselves into the, into the next 50 years. Thanks a lot, Angus. And each of you would then just give your broad understanding of how you feel about the topic. Okay, well, independence is really about self-rule, um, self-governance, um, which we did in 1974, and we proceeded to do. Um, however, on reflecting on the eve of our 50th um, anniversary independence, um, it is important to know that our journey um, towards independence has been a, a different, a bit different, um, and a bit unique as compared to our counterparts um, in the Caribbean, uh, out of um, and the West Indies, and so forth. Um, so therefore, our road towards independence was never a smooth one, and we cannot get away from the history as uh, Mr. John had uh, highlighted um, earlier on. Um, in my view, it was shrouded with controversy, confusion, and conflict. And as um, one of our historian, past historian, deceased Mr. George Brizan, um, rightly penned it, called Grenada, name a book after it, Grenada, the Island of Conflict. And it appears, though, from since then on, there have always been constant conflict there and about around the Grenadian politics and so forth up to now. Um, I would say it was marked by a bitter rivalry between government and opposition, and opposition at that time had their reasons for it. Um, I say, uh, not that the opposition didn't want independence, they wanted it at the time, but their concern was a real meaningful independence, which I think we should go back to. Um, the concern, some of the concern was just, uh, you don't want to just have a, a symbol, a symbolism, or uh, just something to celebrate. You want to have uh, really to do with transformation um, of the entire development of Grenada. And um, so therefore, I think um, we ought to pursue that in going forward. We need to focus on these areas in terms of transforming the state and the development and the economic development of the state in a meaningful way in going forward from here on. Um, good afternoon. Since we are going on to 50, it is important for us to reflect on the past as we look forward to our future. 49 years is a long time to be an independent nation, and even before the 49 years of independence, and we weren't independent, there were years of failure, victory, bloodshed, hurt, and perseverance. We are almost at 50, and it's time to look back at how far we have come and how we can move forward. Um, for me, um, the journey to 50, reflecting on the past, planning for the future, um, means that we have an opportunity to look at the unique journey that we've began since 1974. Um, we've had a revolution, an invasion, two hurricanes, and other things that may or may not have maybe slowed the progress that we intended to have. However, as we approach 50, um, we have the opportunity to look at the losses, lessons, achievements, and gains of the past 49 years and use them to inform our future so that by the time we get to celebrating 99 on, and looking at the 100, we can look back satisfied at how much we would have achieved. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for me, the journey to 50, reflecting on the past, planning the future. I believe this team sums up or it reflects everything that Grenada needs for development. The journey which we've been on for the last 49 years and we're continuing, um, it speaks to the process, everything that we've been through as Ms. Sorry, Ms. Barrett said, um, a hurricane, um, the revolution, everything that we've been through. 
the past, reflecting on the past. I'm not a historian, but I always preach, I always say that it's necessary for us to be aware of our past, especially being youth, where we don't know, we weren't there at the time. So it's necessary for us to be aware of our past, to inform our future, to kind of be a roadmap of, of our guide as to what we, to what we ought to do and what, we not, what we're not supposed to do. Um, planning for the future, taking into consideration a journey to 50, um, being aware and valuing our past, I think it is necessary for us to plan and prepare for whatever it is to come, taking into consideration everything we've been through, learning the lessons that was supposed to be learned. So that's pretty much what the theme means for me, and I think it's necessary for our development as a nation. Thank you. Thanks to, to all of you panelists and what they have really done for us They've, they've helped us understand that a mixed picture emerges when we think about Grenada as we reflect um, on the eve of 50. There's a mixed picture. We've had highs and lows and twists and turns. A tapestry, really, of victories and mispromises. What we want to do now is to delve a little bit deeper into some specifics. And I would first invite John Angus Martin to take us on that sort of pre-independence journey. I would want you to locate Grenada's independence within Grenada's historical quest for freedom. And we've had a long, long search for freedom. And in fact, we're still searching for freedom. I want you to locate that for us. And what were some of the interrelated factors that led to Grenada's independence? And more importantly, I would want you to help us understand what are some lessons we can learn from Grenada's history to inform our way forward on the eve of 50. You have seven, not more than 10 minutes. Thanks. Um, I think as a historian, uh, in looking at, even though we're looking at 50 years, um, we have to go further back, um, really far into Grenada's history. I think for me, I would think the first thing that came to mind would be Leaper's Hill. The idea of, and I know there's, it's very convoluted, the whole history of Leaper's Hill and what it means and what actually happened. But I think we see that as a symbol and I would speak of it more as a symbol than a historical fact and, and, and the incident itself. But the idea that, that people will die in order to, to attain freedom. And I think we, you, are, you can look at other aspects in that history across, you know, Fedon's Rebellion as well comes to mind on these episodes that in our history where people are fighting for things that are much more important than just food and, 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 and basic survival, that there is a larger uh, desire for freedom. And I think when you come up 1951, so we have these seminal events in our history that really laid the groundwork uh, for the idea that um, Eric Gehry, who was a very big proponent of Grenada's uh, independence, even when we got as associated statehood, he actually um, made it his goal to get rid of associated statehood as early as he could because he felt that it was, um, it, it was not a place that we need to stay too long. It really didn't help us to be in such a, uh, a midway between this internal self-rule, but um, our external um, rule was, was controlled by the UK. So I think in looking at the, the basic um, road, road map for Grenada's independence, we look at it beginning in 1967, when we achieve um, internal self-government with associated statehood. And Gary came to power that same year and made it his goal to get rid of it as soon as he could. Um, and the, the, the issue that was placed before him was that in order for us to even, for the UK, to consider granting Grenada independence, there was to be some form of a referendum and where the majority of people would decide that's where we wanted to go. And for Gary, that came in 1972 when there was an election and he um, put it as the plank of that manifesto that we are gonna go for independence. And with that set, the British government decided, sure, whatever the results, we will abide by that. Because Gary didn't want to ask for independence, 
he wanted it conferred on Grenada. He was very specific about that, that we were not asking for this, but you need to give this to us because this is what, this what needs to happen. Um, in the election of 1972, uh, the Grenada United Labor Party under Eric Gary won 13 to two, um, which Gary took as a resounding support for his, um, his manifesto and his quest for independence. So he really didn't see anything stopping him at this point, even though opposition began to build uh, in, in, with the, the GNP, even though Blaze had initially supported um, Gary going, um, he accepted the invitation to go to London to support independence. But with the New Jural Movement under Maurice Bishop, and the 1970s was a really turbulent time in the Caribbean, in Grenada, um, you had a lot of uh, the Black Power Movement was, and not just in Grenada, but throughout the Caribbean and even in the US and in Canada, where Caribbean people were involved in these struggles for greater civil rights. So that reflected in Grenada, and you had incidents going on in Trinidad, um, and Gary had a, there's a famous comment by Gary, um, when somebody else, when your neighbor's house is on fire, you wet yours. Um, so he started taking precaution because he had a very strong opposition. The New Jural Movement especially, uh, they were pushing really hard. Some might even say some of the things they did were almost seditious that um, pushed Gary to the limit. And I think for some reason he may not have recognized their plan in, in pushing him. And he almost went along sometimes with their plan, not knowing, I think. I think they, 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 I think that they outsmarted him in many respects when he, um, when he pushed back at them and he made some mistakes which they gained ground as a result. So we see um, in, in, in 1973, we had a lot of um, internal issues in Grenada where um, the opposition was protesting. Um, we had what we call Bloody Sunday uh, incident up in Grenville where um, Bishop and a number of others were beaten. Um, that led to uh, Grenadian society, um, um, the labor unions, the churches decided to oppose Gary's uh, bid for independence. They pressured him into, into a number of uh, commission to investigate the beatings and things like that. And by the time Gary was granted independence actually in 73, we had Bloody Sunday, which eventually led to Bloody Monday, which was the demonstrations that resulted in the death of Maurice Bishop's father on the carnage, uh, the looting, the shutdown of the entire country, um, with Grenada achieving independence on the, a state of emergency. There was no electricity uh, in Grenada when Grenada achieved, achieved their independence. Uh, the British did not send anyone to represent the, the, the royal family as they normally would have in these cases. So Grenada, it was very turbulent the, the, the road to uh, independence. And it's something that I think um, we, we, we don't know much about, we don't really spend much time talking about because that really, that period leading up to independence really laid the foundation for what would happen in the late 70s and would continue all the way through with the, the antagonism between uh, the opposition and the government and almost violent, one would say, that um, the violence of the 70s went all the way through the 80s. So I think it's something that we really need to spend more time looking at that period. I think we probably will talk about it in the revolution. Right? So what does it say? What are the lessons for today? Um, I think we really need to learn more about, about history. I did a paper on looking at Ferron's Rebellion, comparing Ferron's Rebellion to um, the Grenada Revolution. And I said, had they known more of what actually happened in Ferron's Rebellion, they would not have made the same mistakes. And I think that goes for every government. Um, if they know what the actual um, challenges were um, for these previous governments, they would not make some of the same mistakes, which we do see keep reoccurring. I think one of the things that uh, came out of the revolution was the pressure that the, 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 the uh, revolutionaries were under in trying to accomplish so much in such a short period that they really overworked themselves. And I think 
we, we, we put so much pressure on government sometimes, and they also make us think that they're the new, the guess, best guys in town and they're gonna get everything done for us. And that pressure causes them to basically overwork themselves and ended up, end up not really being able to give us what we can and, and being, becoming a failure as opposed to a success. Right. Th thanks a lot, Angus. What, what we've heard was that the, the journey to independence was a turbulent one. If I, if I may add, there, there was turbulence, but, and I would, I would date myself, <laughs> growing up in that period, there was also a sense of optimism and nationalism. I remember the, 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 the cultural, it was rich culture. Grenada, I mean, the, the, the songs being in primary school, we, we, we believed in something called Grenada. It was a period of turbulence, but it was a period where there was optimism that we could govern ourselves. So there was, there was a, a mixed kind of picture again emerging, very turbulent journey. And we, for those of you who have question and answer at the end, some students may not have known that on the night of independence, Grenada was in darkness as Angus was saying to us, yes? So thanks very much for taking us to that sort of pre-independence journey. I want to now go to Terry Noel. Terry, help us understand the pivotal moments between 1979 and 83. Um, I was walking through St. George's this morning and I saw a, a young guy with a t-shirt that said, it had Maurice Bishop's face on it, and he said, this is what independence meant for me. Now help us understand, in what ways was the Grenada Revolution part of Grenada's larger search for freedom? Because sometimes we like to reduce the Grenada Revolution to an event that was just about who killed who in October 1983. It was so much more than that. Um, so help us understand, how do we locate it in that larger search for freedom? And what were some of the key accomplishments and lessons, and more so, on the eve of 50, what can we learn from that period? I know I'm asking you to do a lot in seven to 10 minutes. Be succinct. Yeah, well, I would say, um, I would say a revolution is, is necessary um, sometimes, I believe. Uh, we had, uh, among the wall, around the wall, we had uh, the French Revolution. We have the, the, uh, the American Revolution, as well as the Russian Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. So I believe it is necessary at times, and there are times uh, individuals, personalities, and so forth, create the ideal conditions which is necessary for revolutions to occur. And in my view, such was the situation in, uh, in 1979 um, during the Morris Bishop um, Revolution. And, and these revolutionaries, like I had mentioned before, they were talking about real independence. Uh, they didn't see the independence that so Eric Geary and so forth was talking about as, as real independence. They were talking about a total transformation and um, development in terms of economics as well as political. Um, I would think the Eric Geary independence uh, was mainly focused on the political independence. But um, we need to have economic independence as well. That is very important because you could go and give, you know, you give pretty speech and so on, but you have to take care um, of, of, of the people, you know, and so forth. So, in, in terms of the revolution, I, I believe the revolution um, taught us a lesson. It actually showed us a different way, a different approach to um, development and politics in itself, different political system that we experimented with, which was a you know, kind of Marxist, uh, socialist-oriented um, system that we, we, we used at that time. And I, I believe uh, from 1979 to 1983, um, Grenada had experienced some of the, um, the biggest achievements we had ever seen um, during that part um, of, the, of, our, of the revolution itself from 1979 to 1983. Um, we had, in some of the achievements we would have in education, um, matter of fact, prior to the actual revolution itself, you only had something like about 302, I think, children having access to secondary education. And within a year, it went to about 1,032 um, students having access to education. And we're talking about free education. Um, so, so across the board, 
free education was introduced to ordinary vulnerable people who had the opportunity now to have free education. And even beyond that, um, you also had situations where um, scholarship were given. So beyond the secondary education, um, ordinary Grenadians who have the ability was given scholarships to study abroad um, in places like Cuba, um, Russia, um, in North Korea and some of the other countries, as well as in the United States and England and so forth. So in terms of the education in itself, we have seen a, a drastic improvement uh, and so forth. In terms of illiteracy, um, we have seen the uh, downward spiral in terms of illiteracy at that point in time because we had the certain programs, educational programs that was introduced, which is to do with the CPE, where people, older people could be involved in certain programs and learn to read and write and so forth. Um, there were even um, the, the books, books and uniform program that was given to vulnerable um, students and so forth, as well, as well as teachers receiving training and so forth. And the revolution didn't just focus on academics. There were, I think it was on a Friday, which was prescribed specific for teachers to go to some level of training. And while the teachers are doing that, then you had skill training was introduced into the school. So after students leave school, they have something to fall back on. So these are some of the achievements in terms of as far as education in itself. Um, but there are other achievements in terms of, we may say, um, in agriculture, which is to do trying to revive the agricultural sector. Um, there's, they had suffered in some cases because of outside pressures and so forth. But the establishment of the marketing board and so forth, MNIB, or in terms of where farmers would be able to have their produce been marketed was um, very instrumental in terms of the development of, of, of this country. And it still is today. And we are still reaping, reaping the benefits and so forth from it. So um, outside of our culture, we also saw some level of um, achievements in health as well, because we had um, where you had Cuban doctors and so forth was coming in and assisting and so forth and um, so forth in terms of um, administering health care to ordinary, ordinary Grenadians in the dental um, sector and so on and so forth. So there had been um, a, a lot of um, achievements that we could look back at. But I think one of the um, biggest achievements um, thus far would we'll look back at the, the construction of the international airport. And as I would remember, um, Morris Bishop in his speech was saying, he mentioned agriculture as one of those areas to benefit from the construction of the international airport. But not just agriculture in itself, we talk about tourism. A lot of people sometimes tend to just um, focus on the tourism and forget the agricultural part because we could ship our fresh fruits and vegetables better and so forth, um, as I remember him making those remarks in one of his speech. So there's, there are numerous benefits, I think, that we have um, that has been derived from the from 1979 um, to 1983. The NIS, um, the NIS is one of them that we are benefiting from where people can um, receive something uh, later on in their lives and so on as we contribute towards it. Um, and we could go on and on. These are just some of the areas that um, we'll cover, but, but there are a lot more um, in terms of our achievements and the whole idea of this political consciousness. I mean, Grenadians by and large was able to experience, like we say, a different type of uh, politics, a different type of political system, and uh, we became more political, politically conscious minded, and, um, and so forth. Uh, but going, in the future, going towards the future, um, there are things to learn. Uh, the revolution did make made some mistakes no, n nonetheless. And we probably need to look at those mistakes and to ensure that those mistakes uh, never repeat itself again in going, for, in going forward in um, chat, chatting our, our, our future forward for our people and our children. Thank you very much, Terry. You were able to pull together in a very short time um, that slice of Grenada's history. And if, if someone were to ask, what makes Grenada unique? in terms of uh, Caribbean politics. It was the only Commonwealth Caribbean country that actually had a socialist revolution. And, and Terry, the takeaway from, from what you said for me 
was that, again, there's a mixed bag. At the end, yes, you talked about the fact that they made mistakes, and they did. Um, but the, the accomplishments in that very short space of time, and what are we seeing as a common thread running through Grenada's journey? Angus was able to help us understand the turbulence leading up to the role of Britain in terms of Grenada being a colonial state. So there were always external factors, and there were always internal factors. And the convergence of the external and the internal always kind of would influence and shape the twists and turns of the journey, the meanderings that we would have gone through. So thank you for helping us understand. Just give us a glimpse. You gave us a glimpse of that period. For those of you who are much younger, it's important to understand that what happened in Grenada from 1979 to 1983 must be remembered. We must reflect on it because from it we can get so much that we can learn from. Whether it's in the field of education or agriculture, our own Maribo Tamsisi campus came from that period where agriculture was central to Grenada's economic development and social development as well. So thank you, Terry. I want to now turn to Akima Telesford Modest, one of our young students here. And I want you to focus on education for me. This is Tam Sisi. And we are here standing on the shoulders of a lot of those who would have gone before us. And I want you to help us understand what are some of the strengths of our education system. You came from primary school through the Anglican High School. You're here now at Tam Sisi. What can we celebrate in terms of our education system and what may be some of the gaps? But importantly, as we stand on the eve of 50, what type of education for the type of society we must create for ourselves? Tell us a little bit about, from your young perspective. Um, well, I reflected on these three points and for the strengths, um, COVID just passed, and I think one of the things that we adapted to really quickly was the online platforms. We already had them in schools, but the way in which we were able to quickly switch shows that we were already prepared enough. And it was easier for the children to adapt to the online platforms, the Moodle, the Edmodo, using Zoom, using Google Meet. The, it was easy for them to do that. So it shows that the schools were taking an interest in the IT. Moving forward with the world as a whole, they were able to move forward quickly. Um, another one is that the students with special needs, they are helped. Yeah, there are schools and even with not the the students being that advanced that they have to go to the school for special needs. But even in the schools themselves, there are students that have special needs that are helped. The students help them, the teachers help them, and that is something to commend. Also, the teachers themselves has a drive and a determination for helping the students, especially during, as we had the pandemic. They were pushing especially the students that had to do c -sex exams. They were pushing them, those in Form 3, Form 4, Form 5, pushing them to do as best as they can and better. Um, what is necessary for advancement? I was saying mental health. We can take a look more into mental health in, of the students in the nation. Have more counselors. At the schools, I don't think one counselor is enough for a secondary school of 800 children. They would have students that would have mental breakdowns, especially the Form 5, there's like 100 students in the Form 5 itself. Those students would have mental breakdowns. You would have students that aren't mentally prepared for everything and they would need help. So I don't think one counselor would be enough. We have to work on that. 
more hands-on learning with the students, especially its students at younger ages the, in the grade, grade one to six. Uh, more technical and craft skills. Like back then they had the work, woodwork in schools. They could put that back because they would have students that not all students are academic. They're not with the maths, the English. Maybe they may more like to do woodwork, craft skills, and they could get jobs. And if we cater for that down here, then we don't have to spend money to send them away to learn all these skills later on. Um, and history, as Mr. Terry said, history should be something that we learn since in primary school. It should be something that we, by the time we reach secondary school, we have a deep appreciation from for we know where we came from and where we want to go. Um, and you said um, things that we can do differently to improve the education system. Um, I was saying, um, as I was saying before, the history, if we start at a younger age, it would be much easier to teach them at an older age about everything that went on. Because if we can do, we have, example, a program at the time, CC, History in Grenada. It's 15 weeks. If you could take 15 weeks to teach, how much, 17, 18 year olds, the history of Grenada from way back then to now, in 15 weeks, I think we could teach the children in one year that whole syllabus. Um, and education was a big thing back then in the revolution and everything. I don't think right about now we have a drive for it. So we have to help, well, I don't know how to say it. We have to, you know, m make kind of the students want an education No, because you hardly find students that want to go to school. Everybody wants to stay home, who wants to stay on the street. Oh, um, we bad man and all these things on them. We have, we have to get them back in school, you know, even though they're not academic, you know, as I said, the technical skills, you could give them woodwork and stuff to do. Well, woodwork is one example, but it has others, you know, and yeah, that's for me. Thank you very much, Akima. Thank you very much. And, and, and what, what you've helped me um, try to put in perspective from the perspective of a young person, the, as society changes, how then should our education system change to respond to that society? If we speak now about transformation, and if we're reflecting back on the revolutionary education that we had back then, what needs to change? And you said something about mental health that struck me, because we have a situation in society that we have in mental health almost as an epidemic now. And how is the school system responding? But what are we doing in terms of training, educating um, persons to become experts to treat to mental health? That becomes important. History, I always say that. We need to ensure that we teach our history and from an early age. And the question about skills learning, I remember some, we used to call it the wing where people would go and learn trade and so forth and so on. So it's important that we have a balanced approach to education. And in the end, you were saying, if I may paraphrase you, how do we inspire students to want to learn? As we think about a new society going forward, and we can speak about this when we open up for questions and answers, how do we inspire students to want to learn? That's the question you've really left us with. And that has taken us straight into questions of human and social development. As we think about independence, and we can ask, do we just have a society? Or do we have a just society that it's about the whole of the human being, the whole experience? Do we just focus on economic development, or do we focus on human and social development? What must independence mean in terms of how we live? how we live in our communities. So I want to invite Vanessa Bar Barrett to speak to us from a human and social development perspective. What have been some of the achievements 
uh, in terms of human and social development since independence? And what are some areas for improvement? And as we think about going toward 50, what can we do differently to advance human and social development in Grenada? Vanessa. Well, firstly, um, I think before we go forward or even begin to look at um, the period from 1974 forward, we must bear in mind that Grenadian society, like other Caribbean societies, were artificially created slave societies um, that revolved around plantation agriculture. Now, as a result, um, real investment were not made in the societies into the masses. Um, you had an elitist society where any kind of investment in the society revolved around the elite and did not necessarily benefit the masses. So as a result, for example, um, the colonial legacy that was left in the society that um, we would say Eric Gary and um, his government would have um, inherited in 1979 as an independent state, um, you had a monocultural economy that was dependent on the export of low-value agricultural raw materials, um, which did not necessarily put our economy in a good place. Um, we had poor infrastructure in terms of roads and buildings and so on. We had very high unemployment. Um, in 1979, it was 49 percent. And we also had a very poor health and education system. Um, in terms of health, um, the majority of the population had very poor nutrition, tropical diseases like yaws, um, a very high infant mortality, mortality rate, sorry. Um, you had the majority of the population also having lack of access to basic sanitation and those kinds of things. Now, when it came to education, um, our school system was still very much um, revolved around primary school education um, that did not necessarily um, seek to create um, trained and qualified persons, but a labor force um, suitable for the estate and plantation economy. Um, the education system remained very elitist as well. Um, you had fee-based secondary school education that would have served to preserve the status quo. So we have to bear in mind those things. And in terms of looking at the advancements that have been made in terms of human and social development um, since independence, one of the first things that we can focus on is the improved standard of living. Right? Um, we have, for example, our per capita income. Grenada is now considered as a middle income country. Um, in terms of per capita income, in 1950, the per capita income, which is usually measured in um, terms of US dollars, was $450, um, purchasing power parity. Now, it is for 2021, um, we were recorded at $9,010.60 US. So we've made um, remarkable strides in terms of that. Um, in terms of the Human Development Index, our rank um, is 68 out of 191 countries, um, which puts us in a position better than countries like Jamaica. Um, I was even surprised that we surpassed Barbados. We're two points ahead of Barbados now. And um, so that means we've done very well in terms of gender equality. Um, well, in terms of education, we've surpassed, women in Grenada have actually surpassed men particularly at tertiary level education in terms of enrollment. Um, in terms of our politics, and this must be mentioned, um, Grenada has always had equality in gender in terms of politics compared to the number of female politicians. Um, particularly now, even if you look at our parliament, we have a relatively good number of women to men. So we've made some strides there in terms of the improved standard of living. Now, in terms of education, um, my colleague, Mr. Noel, would have alluded to some of the strides that we've made in education, and a lot of it would have originated um, during the revolution, right? That period, a lot of strides were made in terms of education, in terms of um, improving access to education at all levels, particularly um, at secondary schools. It was during that period also we would have had that expansion and improve access to education for persons not only at the secondary level but also at the tertiary levels. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have gender parity in education and as it relates to health, um, we've done significantly well reducing infectious disease, the infant mortality rate, childhood diseases, and also improved life expectancy. And this shows that a lot of investment would have been made by the governments um, in terms of improving um, 
the human capital improving our societies in that sense. But at the same time, if we were to think in terms, not as um, Dr. Grenade said, the holistic person, um, yes, we're moving into 49 years of independence, but I guess we can accredit it to modernization, where we're seeing a lot of eroding of a lot of, of our cultural values, right? Um, the things that we once held as important, you know, as a community, that sense of neighborliness and concern for others, we're seeing um, these things declining, right? But again, it is not new to Grenada, but, you know, or novel to Grenada in that sense, and we can credit it to modernization. Um, in terms of areas of improvement, um, yes, we have you know, improved our society in terms of the standard of living and the quality of health and education. However, um, much is left wanting, both in the areas of health and education, and particularly if we were to look at unemployment, right? Um, yes, we have improved standard of living, but unemployment continues to be a very big issue in Grenada. Um, during the revolution, um, they were able to reduce unemployment from 49% to 10% in four years, right? Um, 2015, unemployment was 22.9%. So this shows that we really need to do something to reduce unemployment and inequality. The last country poverty assessment um, for 2018 showed that inequality in Grenada is actually increasing. Right, that means the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing. So even though our society is, the standard of, basic standard of living is improving, the gap between those who have and those who do not have continues to widen. And this could never be a good sign as it relates to um, human development and social development. Um, what can we do going forward? Um, firstly, we need an investment in our human capital. Um, we need to improve training and certification for the population. Um, the World Trade Organization actually pointed out that this is one of the barriers to doing business in Grenada, the fact that we do not have a suitably and properly trained and certified population. And I think, um, for example, because we rely so much on foreign investors to come in and set up hotels and whatever, what you see happening is that when these hoteliers and so on come in, at the basic levels, the kinds of jobs that Grenadians are able to get in the hotels are often entry-level jobs, the minimum wage jobs. We need training and certification so that our population would get the higher paid jobs so they do not necessarily need to bring in individuals to take the positions in management and those things. We should be able to have citizens here who are trained and who can perform these jobs. We also need to take steps to retain our trained, certified, and skilled workers, and prop, um, offering better compensation, right? If we look at the field of healthcare, nursing in particular, we have an exodus of our nurses, and that is because they are not properly compensated compared to other Caribbean islands and even outside of the region. So we need to retain our tertiary um, persons who go on to tertiary education, and we need to invest more in that. And I will conclude by saying we need also to diversify our economy, right? We no longer can depend solely on tourism in terms of sea, sand, and sun, or um, agriculture where we just export raw materials, cocoa, nutmeg, and banana. We need to add value, right, to the agricultural products. Um, we need to invest in, for example, maybe health tourism, and even our creative industry, right? We have so many persons just within the TAMCC um, population, so many students with so many different forms of talent, singers, dancers, musicians of many kinds, and I think we need to invest more in the creative industry, right, in terms of diversifying, because we saw from the pandemic what happens if we were to continue that dependence on tourism. And I conclude by saying that we need um, food security, right? Mr. Noel alluded to economic independence. We cannot have any kind of economic independence when we have such a very high food import bill and we are dependent even on things like meat, even cabbage and carrots. We need to import these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for helping us understand from a human and social development perspective. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about the work of Amata Sen, that Indian economist. And in 1999, he wrote a book, Development as Freedom. 
And he said that if in fact a country is to be really free, it has to get rid of the unfreedoms, illiteracy, unemployment, ill health. And what you help us to understand here is that as an independent nation, the human capital, our human potential, is very important for us to gain the level of independence that we so deserve. And you said, yes, a lot has happened. We've achieved a lot in the early days in terms of the eradication of a lot of diseases and so forth, but there's some unfinished business. Unfinished business with unemployment. Unfinished business with inequality. Unfinished business in terms of adequate investment in our human capital. So it is important when we think about independence we have to reflect on the history. We have to understand where we've come from. But we, has, we have to also understand the human and the social. What does independence mean to little girls and boys, whether in Birch Grove or Saab or in Gove? How do they live? Do they have access to food? Do they have access to medicine? And yes, we have some unfinished business with our health system in terms of access to good health care. So even as there is a lot to celebrate, as we look forward, we have to ask, what, what is the unfinished business? And how do we then chart a course to ensure that the next 50 years, our human and social development would be so much better than the last 50? So thank you very much, Vanessa Barrett, for taking us through that journey um, from a human and social development perspective. Our final panelists, and yes, we would have some time for questions. Mr. David Ambrose, yes, we go to 3.30, is it? Or thereabout? Or a little before. Jada Glean, as a young Tam CC student and as a young Grenadian, I, I want to ask you pointedly, what does independence mean to you? And from your perspective, what kind of Grenada would you want to see in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years? And and what do we need to do? What is to be done to create that Grenada that we deserve? Let's hear from the youth, Jada Glean. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying, and I think all of us here are away, our youth today are not, I don't think they understand the true meaning of independence. All we know growing up, um, it's a day where we dress up in our colors, um, it's a day where we wear, where we eat oil down. Mm -hmm. It's a day where we would see on TV, or if we go in person, the men in the, well, men and women in their uniform going to the stadium. But I don't think, oh, and also we hear about Uncle Gary. Mm -hmm. um, it's a day that he would have fought to get for us. Um, I don't think as youth, much attention is placed on the true meaning of independence, what it means to be an independent nation. And I'm tabling on everything that would have been said because I feel like all of these aspects are important for us as you to understand what independence is. Um, Mr. Noel touched on what real independence is. Real independence is transformation, as you said correctly. I do believe um, that as youth, just focusing on the surface is not sufficient. We need to delve into the, the deeper understanding, get a deeper understanding, a deeper meaning. And Ms. Sorry, Ms. Akima would have touched on education. I think education is very important, and education in terms of relating to our history. She touched um, one of the weakness of our school system, our education system, is the, the value or the role we placed on history. History for us, again, reiterating, is just on the surface. Um, when I did CSEC, because I did history for CSEC, we touched on the Grenada Revolution just before we had to write our CSEC examination. So we didn't get a lot of time to spend it. And, <laughs> and that was, to me, kind of weird, for lack of a better word. Because as the team suggests, um, we need to know our past. We need to know, I, I, I said this in my opening statement, we need to know what it is we're not supposed to do. That should be like a roadmap or a guidance as to what to do and what not to do come future. Um, Mr. Martin, you, you highlighted um, on how important it is for us to know our history, to inform our decisions for the future, and I definitely agree with that. As youth, um, I don't know, we, we lack some sort of, 
I think the basic principles or values that would have been instilled in the older heads, we, we lack that now. And I think it starts in the school as well as in the home. So in terms of education, we need to revamp our education system to tailor it to our youth of today. Akima spoke about inspiration and motivation. We, we need that because it's really difficult getting out on mornings and saying, oh, I don't want to go to school, seeing that we, it's termed as our way forward or a way out of what we, we call poverty. But um, so I'm touching on that. As a Grenadian youth, what does independence mean for me? Growing up, it was just the surface, seeing, dressing in my colors, my red, green, and yellow, eating oil. But I think as I grow older and I spend time in the Constitution, which is an instrument of our independence, by the way, I understand that, okay, the privilege that we have being an independent nation, the privilege and the freedoms that comes with being an independent nation, these privileges and freedoms that our ancestors, our forefathers never had. Um, so I think that is a major thing. Also, as part of our education, the Constitution being an instrument of independence should be included within our education system because it's the foundation for our legislation. And quoting on staying with history, the Constitution plays a major part within our history. So we really need to build on that foundation and continue to embed in us and instill in our youth those values, these basic values and principles. Then, other question was, what kind of Grenada would you want to see in the next 10 or 20 years? This is somewhat a, uh, how do I phrase it? Um, for me, a Grenada that is led by the people. Um, yes, we have a democratic system. Yes, the people um, influence the policy making, political decisions or so. But I feel like we need to see more of that. We need to, um, actually create more avenues for the people to be involved in the legislation um, making system. And I think during the revolution, you would have had all of that. Or even before that, you would have had the town hall meetings, which we see coming back slowly but surely, um, giving the, the current government. But we need to, to have the people engage, have them away. Because with the democratic system, the people are, we're, well, we're the policy makers, but we instill or we put people in there that would put things in place for us that reflects us, our values, our beliefs. And if we refer to our constitution, we would see that in section F. Um, I'm very big on the constitution, so if I, I mention it a couple of times, then that would be why. But um, so playing on that, I really think we need to involve our people more, and not just those, not just the selective few or the higher class, as Ms. Barrett would have um, referred to it, but everybody. We're going down to the layman, we're going down to the, the ground level because everybody needs to be involved in the decision-making process. Because after all, after at the end of the day, it affects all of us. Um, just as uh, with taxes, the taxes affects those in a higher class, it affects middle class, it affects the lower class. So we need to be prepared for that. Um, what needs to be done to create the future we desire? I would start with this. I think as individuals, um, Grenadians, we need to understand that no man is an island. Yes, we're living on an island, but no man is an island. We all need each other. We all have a responsibility to each other, and our constitution actually refers to that. Um, in our preamble, which obviously is a foundation for our legislation and for our constitution, it states that, just let me quote, whereas the people of Grenada have affirmed that the nation is founded upon principles that acknowledge the fatherhood and supremacy of God and man's duties towards his fellow man. That is, the fact that it's the start of our constitution says a lot, that is very important. We tend to have this, I'm speaking loosely here, selfish nature sometimes. It's me, 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 and once I'm good, we neglect everybody else. For us to move forward as a nation, for, develop, for us to see development, for us to see change, we need to come together, we need to work together, we need to engage everybody. And I think it starts with the home, it starts with training the children, because in primary school, it was always coming first, it was always being top, it was always a competition. Healthy competition is good, I get that, but we need to start, I don't know, building that, that community again. I think that is very important for us to, to move forward. Um, so for me, that's the a, that's a most important thing. I think once we establish that, once we get rid of or create that balance for that selfish nature, we would definitely see a bigger and a better Grenada and we have more room for growth. Growth, more room for development. 
our youth are very important. We are, y'all always speak to us, we are the future. Um, but the future is now, so why not start embedding these things in us now? Why not start instilling these basic values that y'all would have had growing up um, so that when time for us to take our rightful place, um, we would be ready and well equipped. So that's just my, the youth perspective as it relates to um, independence. The last 49 years, I think, specifically referring to the revolution, the youth played a very big role in the revolution. And I say this, and people tell me don't say that. We need a revolution now in Grenada without the bloodshed, without the bloodshed. And when I say revolution, revolution doesn't, everybody thinks revolution, there has to be bloodshed, there have to be gun, there have to be fighting, there have to be some sort of war. But revolution is just a long lasting change. It's just um, bring about that, that development, that transformation, and that what is very powerful, that transformation that we would like to see in our nation. So we need a revolution. We need the changing of our people's mind, especially our young people. The older generation, we also have to teach y'all certain things too so y'all can get on track with us. But um, I think it is very important. That's just me speaking on as a youth, what I see and what we, we observe. Because as much as people like to say, um, we don't know what's going on, we're watching. We're definitely watching. And if you actually sit down and engage with some of the children in Tamsis, you would see that they're watching and they're listening. And they're taking notes. They're taking notes of everything that the, the older folks are doing. And also taking notes of what they would not do when they get up there. I'm, I'm definitely doing that. So. Um, a lot more focus needs to be placed on us as youth as it relates to our history, as it relates to independence or road to independence. Um, education would play a, a major part in that. And then, of course, looking out for each other. That's very important. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jada. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking us to the Constitution and for reminding us about the unfinished business we have with constitutionality in this country. And thank you for reading from the preamble to remind us on the eve of our 49th anniversary of our duty to each other. We did not have a panelist address questions of crime and criminality and youth on youth crime. If we remember our duty to one another, it would be difficult for us to, to, to engage in the levels of crime that we are seeing. So thank you very much for touching on constitutionality on participatory democracy, people being involved much more in their governance. Thank you for speaking about the youth and the awareness. Sometimes when we say that they, they don't care, you say that they're looking. They're looking on and they're watching us. So that's very important. And you mentioned community. You know, as we think about independence, if independence is about freedom and if independence is about nationhood, then independence must be about community. It must be about community, how people live, how people treat each other. What does it mean to be human? If we're asking what it means to be independent, what does it mean to be human? Neighborliness, the values that we cherish that one point that we want to ensure that we continue to have. And of course, you called for a revolution without guns and without violence. You spoke to that revolution in our thinking in terms of transforming our society. And you said it's really a long lasting change, a long lasting positive change. So ladies and gentlemen, and to those of you online, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues online, um, we, we've had a lot to think about. We've really had an intergenerational dialogue, starting with Angus Martin, speaking about what led up, the turbulence that led up to the 1974, and then Terry Noel speaking about, most specifically about the Grenada Revolution and some of the achievements and some of the limitations. And then Akima zeroed in on education and some of what we need to be doing, perhaps, perhaps thinking about mental health and, and some of the other areas that as we evolve as a, as a society, our education system needs to um, more be in tuned with. And then Vanessa spoke to us about human and social development and what we have achieved and the unfinished business uh, in terms of investing in our human capital. And then Jada brought it together for us in terms of what do we see when we look forward? What is the type of Grenada that we think we deserve? How do we ensure that our constitution reflects us? 
How do we ensure that we engage in more participatory democracy? How do we ensure that we build community? So this is your turn. We have about 15 minutes to engage with you. Um, some questions. Um, you would, those of you online, how are we getting questions from those online? But those of you in the audience, we'll be happy to hear from you comments or questions. Yes, the floor is open. Yes, introduce yourself and ask your question or give your comment. A comment. Good afternoon. Happy Interdependence, everybody. Um, what, I, what I'm going to say is going to be short and sharp and, and extremely upsetting, so please hold your seats tight. Um, a constitution, or let's say a birth certificate, determines whether I am born or whether I am born determine a birth certificate. That constitution that the slave master writes for us, that created our nation. Grenada, which is bubbling from the volcano that God made how much billion years ago, that is 50 years old. My grandmother, 400 years being raped on the plantation, is 50 years old. What kind of 50 are we celebrating? And we're talking. This is the language of the slave master. I cannot speak to you correctly using the slave master language. And as long as it's on the skins of black, of black people speaking white man language. Deep in slavery. The God white. Your laws illegal. Your, everything in this society is wrong because this is based on slavery. You come here and you kill the Caribbean Arawaks and you bring in slaves and then you say you want to make justice and a legal system. Everything I speak is illegal. Everything I do, the buying and selling of food. Before Europeans came to the Caribbean in Grenada and Africa, we ate freely. Freedom is free food, free housing, free medical care, free necessity. You have to pay for education, and you think it gives you freedom? And for the past 50 years or 400 years or 3,000 years in the Caribbean, more qualification is more war, more crime, more destitution, more horrorism, more ignorance, more misery and stress in a society that you're more educated. Yes, okay, thank Students you. Students are going to be killing themselves more. I said it's going to upset you. And I said I'm going to finish very quickly. Right. Because we are not teaching them the most important lesson of all. Who are you and why are you here? What are you doing on this planet? Why are you carrying students into your institution, helpless from two years old, and giving them information to contribute to the destruction of people, places, animals, and planet? You all ready for this? Okay. Thank you for your contribution, for your comments. And I do agree with you that when we think about 50 years, we're thinking about political independence. But long, long before 50 years, my ancestors and yours, we knew what it was to be Grenadians. So I, I, I accept that that is something that we have to think about as well. When did Grenada begin? Political independence was 1974. But way before, there was something called Grenada. And we, that's why we started with the sort of pre independence history but thanks for your comments any other question or comments keep it brief so that we could get in as many uh, as possible before you move on uh, Dr. Yes. Bernard, I just want to add just want to add a little bit to what he's saying since he's speaking about our colonial past and so on and the atrocities that was committed and so forth um, in terms of the actual independence process itself um, um, based on my research I remember the the new drill movement which was the opposition at the time was actually one of the things that they wanted to negotiate with England about was reparations, which is talked about today. So which means they were way ahead of their time in talking about, talking about reparations. They wanted to be compensated for the wealth that was exported from our territories to uh, the industrialized world. So that was very much pass and parcel on the table where the NGM and the revolution was concerned. Well, not the revolution yet, but the NGM um, talking about it, and they wanted that be part and parcel of the whole negotiation process in terms of the independence. Yeah. And if I may add too, you know, there's a whole debate as to what independence is, because some argue that you cannot have political independence and economic dependency, and that's a valid argument. And I, I, I argue that using George Lamin, that Barbadian intellectual, he, he speaks of the sovereignty of the imagination. How do you define yourself? Who are you? And if we limit our understanding of independence 
just the political independence in terms of sovereignty in Grenada being a legal personality you could vote in the UN. Those are, that's important. But the cultural dimension of independence we cannot miss. And when we ask who are we, we must be able to define ourselves and present ourselves to the world with dignity, understanding what our true Grenadianness is. And it's very important on the eve of independence to reflect on that. What is independence outside of the state being sovereign? And that is important. What does it mean for us as Grenadian people? As Jada said, beyond wearing the colors and eating the oil down. What does it mean? Yeah, let's hear from you. Any questions or further comments? I think when you look at um, what went on in the, in the early 70s, the people who were involved, um, as Jada had mentioned as well, there were lots of young people. Actually, um, the majority of the people that were part of, that ended up becoming part of the revolution, uh, many of them were late teenagers, we're talking 19, 20, 21. So I think it's, it's, it's probably a good example of how, what, how youth can, bring about change. Maybe it's also, there is a pitfall in there as well, because youth always are not, they, 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 they don't have all of the controls themselves, so, you know, things happen as well. But I think for me, the takeaway would be the, the involvement of the youth um, coming up with a different answer, a different solution. Uh, like we were talking about, you know, Eric Gary said, what are you guys looking for black power? I did that for you guys already, 1951. You know, when you look at the, the leaders of the, of the country were black, you know, the, 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 the clergy. And, you know, he looked at all of those things. He's like, I don't get it. W w what's going on? You know, he didn't get it. He didn't understand because things had shifted away from him and there was another generation looking for something else. You know, even though he wanted independence, they wanted something else in that independence. They had a different definition of, of independence. So I think it's a good lesson in, in, in how you can bring about that change. And I, I don't want to think that um, what happened in the 70s was an anomaly, that's something that just, we had this blink and it happened and we move on, but that, that this can still happen because people are concerned, people are interested in making changes and making positive changes. So I really hope that that becomes an inspiration. You know, we're trying to look for inspiration, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, why we want to go to school, why we want to get educated. You know, what is that inspiration that wants us to really make the changes that we think our society needs? The idea of the fact that we might be becoming less equal, you know, because of the way things are going, that we need to have a, a correction, you know, a revolution, as, as Jada says, um, because we're now more aware of our past and how it affects who we are today. Any other comments or questions? We haven't touched on the environment. Oh, yeah, we have a question or comment. of a country. And if you don't empower that sector in your country, your country will be on a downhill. 
So what I would like to see, our government empower our people. We work hard. As Bob Mali would, would have said, we come out from the wood, slavery, where they beat us with wood. But financially, they're enslaving us. Mentally, we are enslaved. So I would like to see that we come out from this path in our life. Because I mean, I could tell you, I work years. And it's really hard to tell anyone. You know, as a young man growing up, you work so hard, and when you look back, you can't see a future for you. So we need our empowerment. That's where we need to rise. Coming from the, 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 the gutter and rise, empowerment will bring us where we have to. There's a lot I want to say, but the time is short. Thank you. Thank you. So I, th I think we should look forward. Get yes, thank you very much. Very useful comments in terms of how do we move forward? How do we break the cycle of poverty? Um, how do we deal with questions of inequality? And how do we dream beyond where we are so that we can get the kind of society that we deserve? Um, I think we're kind of out of time. Five more minutes. Can we have one more question or comment? One more question or comment, yes? gap between the rich and the poor. Why do you think that there is this wide gap between the rich and the poor? Um, I think um, the widening gap um, between the rich and the poor has a lot to do with um, the whole state of our economy, right? Um, in terms of, well, particularly the information from the last country poverty assessment done in 2018, um, would have been on the heels of the recession from 2008 and um, sort of that, I would say, uh, stagnation of our economy to a certain extent. Um, what you would have seen, and it also coincides with the fact that um, the number of persons who are actually considered poor and vulnerable has sort of increased as well. So it is a situation where Yes, there is money circulating, but is who is benefiting or who receives um, the money in that sense, right? Because yes, we have people working, but you ha also have a lot of persons who work for either the minimum wage or below the minimum wage. And then compounded, you also have increasing um, the rising cost of food and utilities and whatever. So yes, people have money, but the amount of money that they have um, and what the money has to be spent on, especially for the poor, um, is greatly reduced. So that is, well, one of the factors or some of the things that you would say that is contributing to that um, widening gap in inequality. Okay, thanks to all of you. We've actually run out of time, but I think this was a very, um, very useful and meaningful session. I want to thank the principal and the management team for um, helping us organize this event. I specifically want to thank Mr. David Ambrose for coordinating it, getting the panelists together, and um, for making this the success that it was. To members of the council who are here, Ms. Is Angela Finley, our chief education officer, thank you. And to those council members who may be viewing online. To the deans who are here, Mr. Max Sween and the associate deans, and all the members of staff, lecturers and students, thank you very much for showing up. To GIS and our technical team, we really want to thank you for covering this event. And to the panelists, to Angus Martin and Terry Noel and Akima and Vanessa and Jada, thank you very much for helping us understand the journey to 50, reflecting on the past and planning the future. Thanks to all of you. It was my pleasure indeed as chair of the council to, um, to moderate this panel, and I look forward to many, many, many more events like this. Because Tam CC has to continue to play its role in uh, our Grenadian society as we delve deeper into you know, public outreach and public education and just ensuring that Tam CC becomes uh, a deeper reservoir from which Grenadians can draw intellectually and otherwise. So thanks to all of you.